So I'm Nicolas uh, and I'm the CTO of Mayor's Agent. Who knows? I'll try again. Okay, it's better. Who knows Mayor's Agent? One, two, oh, actually a lot of people. So it's kind of weird because we are, uh, so weird or not, maybe it's a good, uh, good news. Uh, we are a marketplace on the real estate market uh, with a specificity we don't do classified or listings like uh, for people who are looking for a new place to live in. We are more focused on the seller's side. Okay, so people who actually already own a property and wants to sell this property to someone else. So this is very, a very important part of the market. And it is a very important part for the real estate agencies because at the end of the day, these agencies, they need these people to give them their property and to help them to, to, sol to sell it, okay? So we are a marketplace in the sense that we have a lot of agencies that are paying a few hundred euros per month to be displayed on our website. And why they want to be here on this platform? They want to be here because we have a very qualified traffic, people who want to sell properties, which comes to our website basically because we provide them with data on the market we help them to estimate their property and this is, this is why they come to, to use our service. So this is completely free on the consumer side and the, the people that are paying for the service are the real estate agencies, okay? And so uh, I've been with Mayor's Agent for four years and a half now. Uh, very intense experience. When I joined uh, four years ago, we were around 10 people, product plus, plus tech plus data. And my mission was basically to help the company to grow this team. So we are now around 60 people uh, in the same functions, basically, except that every team grow like a lot. And the company as well, because when I joined, uh, we had some kinds of, we had a business model which, which was actually a bit complicated because we were selecting agencies, the real estate agencies, that were allowed to be on the platform, okay? And for these agencies, we were uh, like providing them with leads, people estimating their properties on our website. And when they help this guy to sell their property, we basically took a cut on their commission. So it was a good business model, but in order to scale the company, it was not actually the best one. So we switched from this to another business model which is basically a subscription model, which is super easy to scale, at least compared to, to the previous one. So I had the chance to join the company both at a time when the product and tech team was still quite small, and also when we changed the business model. So it was quite interesting to, to see. And so it's kind of a new format for me, the ask me anything format. So I, maybe I can give you some hints about what I could share. So we have a big data and data science team at Meilleurs Agents, uh, around 20 people. And it's really at the core of the business. It's, no, it's not some kind of side project for the company. So we, we really use data as a differentiator on the market. And this is why people come to, to, to use our service. Uh, we worked and my role obviously evolved a lot uh, in, the, in the four past years. Uh, we worked a lot on uh, implementing OKRs. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Yes. Uh, so we, we implemented OKRs for product and tech teams to start and we scaled it for the whole company. So this is also something I can share with you if, if you are interested in, in that. And uh, I have some kinds of a weird role for a CTO since I'm both leading the product and the tech teams, and by leading, I don't mean that I'm doing the product and the tech. I mean that I'm uh, in the executive committee of Mayor's Agent. I am the guy responsible uh, to share information both on the product and the tech. Obviously, I have a VP product, etc., to, to, to do the job on a daily basis, and it is way better than I am uh, on the product side. But this is also something that we can discuss. Uh, at some point, uh, when you scale your company, which role you should uh, hire to, to, to keep growing. And 
obviously anything else that you should think uh, of interest for, for your companies. So let's start. I know that the first question is the hardest one, so. Thank you. Uh, so you, you talked about OKRs. Uh, so mm -hmm. there are a lot of different flavors of the, those. Uh, could you maybe uh, explain a little bit um, what, what, kind of, what is the flavor of OKRs you've implemented and how it's been working for you? Ah, that's a, a good one uh, to start. Uh, so we finally managed to find a way to define OKRs and to share them uh, across the company, but it was really hard, like three years of hard working to, to have something uh, that actually kind of worked, let's say that. Uh, and we started, actually, I was not the guy that decided to implement OKR. The, I was lucky enough to have a CEO which say one day, OK, uh, I want to switch from uh, the way I uh, basically steer my company to a method where I have more data to decide uh, if we should go on this way or this way. OK, so uh, he was the guy uh, who started to ask for implementing OKR. And it's very important because, as you may know, when you want to change something in your company, if you are not aligned with the key executives of the company, it's way more difficult to do that. So we had that. And at that point, we also had, uh, in my team, I was hiring a lot, obviously. We were scaling the teams. And I felt something a bit complicated in my teams uh, in the sense that I had people, uh, especially on the development teams, uh, who were developing features, but when we were asking, like, why are you doing that or this, etc., Hugo told, uh, told us a lot about that also. Uh, the meaning of what they were doing, the sense of their quest, why uh, in the morning you wake up and come to Meilleur Agent, it was not quite obvious for me uh, and for a lot of people to actually explain why they were doing what they were doing and why, uh, what were the main objectives of the company. So a CEO uh, who wants to change the way he drives his company and teams uh, feeling like a bit uh, disaligned with uh, what we were trying to build at, uh, at Mayor's Agence. So this is the starting point and we started like uh, by reading books and uh, talking to people uh, who already implemented this kind of methodologies. And uh, so, yes, we, we've just basically started. Uh, we started by defining OKRs for the company. And uh, when you read books about OKRs, you always find metrics like you need to define three to five OKRs to drive your, your company. And we did not follow that advice. And we defined seven OKRs for the company. Basically, we had at that time seven business units. Seven business units, seven OKRs, OK? So one OKR per, per business unit. And we had a lot of fights between teams and departments uh, on a very interesting topic. My OKRs is better, is better than yours. I, we need to do, to do that, etc., etc. At that point, we, also, uh, we had like three teams, development teams, one data team, two product teams. So we were like in the middle of this fight and uh, all the people were asking for our team to work on their topic, their topic, etc. But, so it was obviously not a big success, but uh, for the developers, it was interesting because they started to understand uh, the, the goal of what they were uh, developing, implementing, etc. So we did that for uh, around a year. What happened also, and what is interesting about that, is uh, we really tried to uh, give to our teams, objectives and key results to achieve, and not uh, a big list of initiatives to develop, OK? So they were the guy, especially in the product and tech team, they were the guy uh, responsible for uh, defining the initiatives to reach the biggest impact on OKRs. And they were also the guys uh, that were basically prioritizing uh, every initiative and uh, basically sharing a plan with the rest of the company, OK? At least we thought we were doing that. Uh, three months after, in a management committee, uh, everyone basically told me, OK, it is a complete mess. We don't know what your teams are doing. And what happened, in fact, uh, was that we gave uh, power to the teams 
but they forgot that with power come responsibilities and the responsibility to communicate, as Hugo told us, was a bit, uh, let's say, uh, we forgot that, okay? So uh, that was the first years of OKR at Meyer's Agent, and we really thought about basically a big rollback of methodologies and uh, coming back to a more traditional uh, approach, like, you know, the, the classic uh, 12 months roadmap with a big plan. You share that with your investors, which, uh, which you share that with your company, executive committee, etc. But still, even if we fail some stuff, like uh, the number of OKRs, etc., and the communication, we still felt that there was something interesting uh, in that methodology, especially on my side, because I felt my team more, uh, let's say, involved in the decision process on what we should build on the platform. So we went for a new years with OKRs. So obviously we did some kinds of retrospective of the methodology. Uh, we decided to switch from seven OKRs to three OKRs which is actually way better because it is more focused on very specific topic to address. And we also tried to fix the communication process, basically telling to the team that they are uh, contributors uh, for the initiative, but they also need to have feedbacks and initiative from the marketing team, the sales team, the executive committee, etc. And we should obviously pick the best ideas among all these initiatives and not only from, uh, from their initiatives. Okay? What is important when you do that, you will collect a lot of initiatives. Basically, we have three OKRs. We have more than 100 initiatives uh, shared by all the teams for, uh, for all the three OKRs. And the tricky part is to be able to choose and to pick the best of them. So to do that, we used a uh, methodology from Intercom, I don't know if you know this company, uh, famous B2B software company, SaaS company, and they use the, uh, a methodology called the RICE. So RICE is for uh, rich, impact, confidence, and is basi basically you multiply uh, the rich. So the rich is basically all the users that will potentially use your feature, okay? Impact, you define from, uh, let's say, from one to four a score, uh, and you will score this initiative, basically you define an objective and you will say, okay, this initiative will have an impact, a low impact or a big impact on, on this, uh, these objectives. Uh, so, uh, rich, impact, confidence. Confidence is, the, I, I think, the hardest to define. You need to ask your team whether they are really confident in all the, the other metrics they define, so the impact, the reach, etc., and the effort. And if they are, uh, they will basically put a one uh, or 100%. Per cent. And if they are not, they will uh, uh, lower the score, okay? And you divide all of the, these three metrics by the effort, basically the number of man days you will need to spend on, uh, on developing the feature. And what is very interesting about that is that suddenly you are able to compare between the initiative and you, are, uh, you, you start to kill, you know, the best idea like, uh, okay, I'm sure that we need to develop that and we will have a big impact, etc. You start to have people that are actually able to discuss on metrics and data to define what you will build uh, in the end, okay? So, and we switched from a 12 months roadmap to a three months roadmap as well, which is, uh, we were thinking first about basically dropping the roadmap at all. The problem with that, and when you have uh, private investors they are like super, uh, how to say that? They need something to see if they are investing in the right company and the roadmap, you cannot avoid that. So we basically switch from the 12 months to three months, okay? So uh, it was better, but not perfect because uh, the mistake we made, uh, so it was in uh, this year, in 2019, uh, the key results we defined with, uh, with the objectives were not that easy to measure. And basically, we had to ask for external companies, you know, to, to do some kinds of uh, polling uh, on uh, both real estate agents or consumer to be able to get metrics on that. And when you do that, uh, you need your product team to define proxies of your uh, main metrics to be able to see if they have an, imp an impact or not on, on the objectives. And it's a bit hard to, how to say that, uh, 
to manage, uh, especially for the management committee, because basically you decide to invest on initiatives and you need to wait for uh, three to four months to get uh, actual metrics and results about that. So that was for 2019 and for the next year. So we basically decided to switch to more, uh, let's say, nervous uh, KPIs, like KPIs that you can measure on a daily basis. Okay. So in the meantime, we built some kinds of solid BI and data platform with all the analytics of the company. And we are now able to define KPIs that we will be able to measure uh, day by day and display that for, for the whole uh, teams. So yes, this is kind of a journey of OKRs. Uh, I'm sure that we, uh, when we will do the retrospective of OKRs at Mayor's Agent in 2020, uh, we'll fail something else. I don't know yet what it will be, but obviously we are not at the end of this process. And you need also to make it evolve a lot, depending on the size of your teams, depending on your management committee, depending on uh, basically the stage of maturity of, uh, of your company. So yes, this is kind of a journey, but uh, as you may have seen, I'm kind of very passionate about the topic. So if you have more questions about that, we can uh, obviously discuss that. Sure, I'll leave other people with questions. <laughs> okay, so uh, another question about OKRs. Uh, <laughs> uh, so basically, did you have uh, OKRs, like company-wide OKRs, and then specific to each teams or uh, or were they just like? That's also a good question. Um, so uh, when you start reading books about OKR, you find a lot of companies, especially Google, uh, who use OKR as a wide framework for the whole companies, okay? Meaning that they define obviously objectives and key results for the company. They take these objectives and basically start to split them for their teams. And uh, within the teams, they also split the objectives of the team uh, for each uh, individual contributor on the team. We didn't do that. And the reason, the main reason about that was that since we were scaling our teams like a lot and very fast, uh, we were afraid that uh, defining uh, objectives for individual contributors will make them focus on their objectives and not on the company or team objectives. So we basically define like the three main uh, OKRs for the company. And we also define more specific uh, objectives and key results for the teams. But we stop there. And so we don't have any objective for, uh, for uh, individual contributors. We have objectives, obviously. We, we have a management team. We need to help people to grow in the company, but we use individual objectives more to help people to develop themselves, a specific skills, or they want to test a new job, or they want in two years to become a manager, etc. They, they have more these kinds of objectives than a, a declination of uh, OKRs for, for their uh, daily contribution. I don't know if I answer your question, but yes. Uh, yes. Um, so company and team OKRs, but yeah. not, uh, not individual contributors. Uh, so a related question to that is, um, how, could, could you give an example of how you would define like a, key, a measurable key result for a tech team? <laughs> uh, because this one. like for sales, you can imagine like, okay, I need to convert like 100 okay. clients and then <clears> you can say like, okay, I'm at 50% of the objective. But for a tech team, I feel like I'm at a point where I just have like uh, a bunch of features to do. I know I have to do them, but it's hard to like put a number on. The You're right. It's very difficult. And as I said before, uh, when I think, uh, at least in my opinion, when you want to implement OKRs, you need to have a very, very solid product team. It's very important. And by a solid product team, I mean people uh, who have really a mindset of data-driven features development, people that are able to invest a lot in uh, product analytics, uh, and you need that or you will not be able to have something that is easy to measure. Even though you have that, uh, it is still complicated because defining something and be, uh, being uh, focused enough to measure that really on a daily or weekly basis, it's also complicated, but it's all start with the product team. To give you a concrete example, uh, we have like uh, a classic organization in terms of teams. We have like squads or feature teams, etc. We call them impact teams at Meyers Agent because each team is responsible for an OKR. This is the 
the, the difference uh, with the feature team. But within these teams, we have like uh, six to eight developers, and with them, we have two product managers. Because product managers, they will obviously do some kinds of backlog grooming, etc. All the tasks that are, uh, let's say, the more uh, general for, for, uh, for product owners or product managers. But you also need to have people that are able to do a lot of discovery, to be able to define metrics, to define the good system of measure of these metrics, etc. And so this is very important to have a focus on that. And what they basically do, at least for the upcoming year, um, we, have, we now have the chance to have a product analyst, a full time, uh, which basically uh, take the data we have in the BI platform and check it every time, uh, build models on top of that, etc. So when we wanted to define the OKRs for Meilleurs Agents for, uh, for uh, 2020, we basically defined the objective with the executive committee. Okay, just the objectives, we want to be there, there, there. It's more like a concrete implementation of your vision. And when it came to the OKR, so we don't implement the method by the book. We have one KR per objective, only one, because we want it to be very simple for every people in the company to be able to share it, understand it, etc. But the KR, we used uh, the product analyst in the team. We asked her about, uh, we basically told her uh, the objectives and we asked her for uh, concrete metrics uh, to be measured. So she made a, a, a picture of uh, the current state of the metrics we wanted to, be, to define. And then uh, she built models to say, okay, if we are very aggressive, we could reach this. If we are more like uh, not so aggressive, we will reach that, etc. And we decided uh, whether we wanted to be very aggressive or not, depending on the OKR. So yes, we are doing that and we are using data. And the tricky part is that you need data. So you need to have a measure system uh, built in in your product, could be analytics, but also all other data that you can collect uh, for instance, we use a lot of Salesforce uh, for the sales side. We have a big sales team uh, talking uh, every day to a lot of real estate agencies, etc. We log everything in that. Also, in that part, you could find very interesting information. So basically, you just need to take every data point in your company and depending on your objective, uh, use that to, to define your cares. But it's more easy to explain uh, than to do, actually. So it's also a tricky part. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned uh, that when you joined the company, there was already a small tech team, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, so you didn't join at the at the start of the company. No, unfortunately, uh, because we sold the company in September for 200 millions of euros. So okay. if I was a founder, it would be a really great story for me. Yeah, but it was interesting. <laughs> so yes, I joined uh, after uh, the company was al already uh, six years old when I joined. Okay, and so yeah, my, my question was, uh, so I guess when you arrived, there was already some CTO or some management. What was the state of things? How did you manage to enter the, the company? And the second part, kind of, um, how did you, uh, what was the size and how did you get to where you are today? Uh, so uh, when I joined, yes, so uh, a CTO was uh, already uh, leading the, the, the team, sorry. And uh, the company was already like uh, we were uh, around uh, 100 people, 120 people maybe. And uh, as I said, it was a very specific uh, story for the company since uh, the company grew actually quite well for six years, but we changed the business model uh, right when I joined. And the tech team at that point, uh, by tech team I mean uh, data science, data engineering, product, and web development, uh, there were around 10 people. With a CTO, like a super solid tech CTO, really, really good uh, for all the things related to architecture, etc. And my mission was a bit different. So when I joined, I was more like a VP of engineering. Uh, basically coming to help grow the team, help on the methodology side, and also help to manage uh, developers and hire new people. So we did some kinds of partnership for like uh, 18 months. 
And when the team uh, continued to, to grow, uh, he was more like a founder guy. So he left the company to found a new company, which is actually quite successful. And at that point, I took the role of CTO. So basically, we don't have a, a VP engineering, a VP of engineering. So I'm doing a bit of tech and a bit of methodology and management, etc. A mix of all of, all of this. And Yes, so uh, that was this phase, and then uh, yes, we, we basically kept uh, growing the team, um, and also uh, the we had to hire uh, or to promote uh, people from, uh, uh, let's say, senior position in development to uh, to management position. So one of my key roles at Meilleurs Agents was to help them uh, in their new role because. Uh, there is a lot of difference from uh, being an individual contributor as a senior data developer from being a data engineering manager. But I had the chance to have very skilled uh, people, both in terms of uh, uh, human skills and tech skills. So uh, two of the people that are leading big parts of tech teams right now were actually developers when I joined uh, the company. And I spent a lot of time with them, uh, helping them go on the management side, basically, which is kind of complicated. But it's also a nice story because uh, I had people uh, starting at a developer position in the company and growing to uh, uh, data engineering manager or data director, etc. So they have kinds of big, uh, big responsibilities in the team right now. Uh, at that point of time, uh, I also have a, a very skilled uh, VP of product, which actually I hired uh, myself when, when I joined uh, Mayor's Agent, who is uh, leading uh, the whole uh, product team. And uh, we are at a point where uh, we've, I think, promoted uh, almost every people that could have an engineering management role. And so we are now in a new phase, uh, meaning that we hire uh, engineering managers. So we did that once, and the guy is joining in January, and we need to hire uh, two more people uh, in the upcoming months. And this is, for the whole team, this is a new topic for us, because we, do, we did some kinds of uh, internal promotion, and we need to switch to something new which is, I think, very tricky because uh, you need to have the perfect fit, uh, especially in terms of human skills, uh, when a new manager is joining the company. So we did a lot on that, especially on the hiring process, uh, involved as much as we can all the developers of the team to be sure that they checked, that they want to work with the guys that will be their manager. Asking, uh, also asking uh, the developers who wants to post potentially change uh, from uh, his uh, current manager to a new one, etc. And trying also to, to help the guy that will take the position uh, to be in good position. Because uh, it's also difficult to join a company where you are not the founder or uh, an existing uh, individual contributor and to become a manager. Uh, so this is what I did when I joined Mayor's Agent. So I have can, can some kinds of uh, knowledge sharing uh, to share with him to help him uh, take his position. But at some point, you cannot continue to promote guys in your team. You need to hire external people. And it's also very interesting because I think that they will bring something new, both in terms of management, in terms of methodologies, etc. And even for me, it will challenge me on the way I drive my team, on the way I define objectives, etc. So it's an interesting challenge, I think. So since you took the position at a point where the team already existed, um, did you try or did you want to reorganize the team? And if so, were there cases where you wanted to remove a position or remove someone in particular? How did that transition go? <laughs> I was lucky enough to have a, a team that was small, like it was, uh, we were 120, 10 people in the tech team for a company uh, building a platform with data science, etc. Uh, my first uh, move uh, in terms of organization was not to think about removing people. It was more to think about, okay, uh, how can we handle all the things that we need to develop with such a small team? So it was more the challenge for me. And uh, at that point, we were uh, just before uh, a new uh, funding round. So uh, we had to do a lot with quite a few people. And it's very interesting because uh, it's a good way to have uh, very solid teams. 
people that are actually helped uh, each other to do some concrete and difficult stuff. So uh, I had that to deal with. Uh, I had obviously to define, clearly define uh, what should be my role and what should be the CTO role. And you need to communicate a lot on that or it will be difficult because obviously there are some kinds of uh, uh, part of the job, especially the management part, you need to define, okay, you will manage this guy, I will manage this guy, etc. Uh, for the organization, uh, since we were rather small, 10 people, you don't have uh, lots of possibility in terms of organization, because we, uh, at that point, we had one data team, one web and product development team, and that's it. And the uh, tricks of organization, it was after when we hired new people. So nothing very complicated on that part, except the fact that, yes, with the CTO already in position, we had to, to de clearly define who should do what uh, in the team. Maybe I have a question of, uh, on hiring. So how did you grow the team? I mean, does it get easier to hire people or is it still as hard as, as at the beginning? It's getting easier uh, because I think we've invested a lot uh, in very costly initiatives like TV ads campaigns. It costs a lot, but when you have a, a brand like Mayor's Agent, for most of people under 30, since you are not uh, in a position to sell a property, uh, you are uh, you are not maybe you know the website, but we, you are not uh, really the target of uh, of our users. Okay, uh, compared to a, a more uh, classified service like Sologer, for example, in France, where when you need to rent a place or uh, when you need to buy uh, a flat or a house, obviously you will go to their to their website at some point. So we had that. Uh, very low uh, brand uh, recognition, especially in the uh, development uh, developers community. And so, but the, obviously all the marketing initiatives will help you to get a, a well-known brand. And uh, for people, I think it's important to work for something uh, that is useful for other people. And marketing will help you on that. But we also invested a lot in events like that meaning uh, taking time to share knowledge, to share expertise on specific points, etc. Uh, we also invested a lot in uh, writing uh, blog posts on a medium, uh, on uh, what were the main topics, tech or methodology or product for the team, to also share and to use that as a key asset uh, when we, we contact people. Uh, to uh, present a mayor's agent, to uh, present our uh, job offers, etc. We wanted to have a content strategy to help them uh, think about, okay, I will, I should uh, at least start a process with mayor's agent uh, because, I mean, all the people, and I, I'm sure that it's, it's true for everyone in the, in the room, we all want the same people could be web development, front-end, back-end, data engineering, etc., DevOps, whatever. We all want the same people. So you, when you are not the best company in the universe uh, in terms of brand recognition, you need to find something else. And for us, the content strategy was very helpful. Also, and as a CTO, you need to do that. You need to hire the best possible HR team to help you uh, hire uh, developers. And uh, I was uh, personally very involved in the, sh the choice of uh, the person that works with my team on a daily basis uh, for the hiring process in the HR team. And this is a game changer. I mean, when you have someone who understands perfectly the product and the tech uh, specificities of the job, when you have someone who is perfectly able to sell your job offers, to explain what are the differences between the team at Mayor's Agent and another tech team uh, and when you have someone that is able to work with your managers uh, every day to help them hire, to challenge them on why you want this guy or this, it's obviously it changed everything for you as a CTO. And before that, I was uh, in a position where I was both doing 
the hiring process as a manager, but also doing a lot of screening uh, on platforms like Talents.io, etc. You have a lot of good platforms right now. Talent for us, it worked very well, so I recommend it. And uh, so yes, the, the you need to connect with other teams in the company and you, you need to involve your people, your developers, your product managers, etc. to be uh, key assets in the hiring process, both uh, really to check if they want to work with the, with the new guy, but also to produce good contents to uh, help other developers or product managers to want to join your company and work with you. So yes, this is what we did. And it seems easy to say, but it was uh, very difficult, like I think for every other companies. You have a lot of people. You are, we have uh, some kinds of inflation on the, on the salaries as well, which is also tricky to handle when you start to have big teams like we have. But yes, uh, you need to work on that. And I think as a CTO, it is maybe the, the most important uh, mission that you have. Uh, if you hire the, the good people, uh, both on tech, product, etc., basically your job is almost done. You obviously need to do something else, but it's very important to focus on that. And I spent a lot, a lot, really a lot of my time uh, crafting a good hiring process, uh, doing a lot of interviews, and uh, step by step uh, teaching to my team how to hire people that they actually want to work with. And so, yes, it takes time. Uh, I did some uh, kinds of uh, KPIs of my, on my time spent on hiring. I didn't do that for this year, but last year I spent almost 40% of my time hiring. Hiring or uh, helping my teams to hire, etc. So, yes, it's, it's very important to, to do that. And it's difficult for us, like for every, I think, for every other companies. Lots of questions about. Let's go back to um, uh, KPI. Um, yeah. So uh, um, okay, I'll sorry. Uh, so um, so you were saying earlier, like you were putting like one key result per objective, and that was uh, the way it was working for you, and that you had someone, uh, if I understood correctly, uh, creating like uh, metrics for uh, based on product metrics. Someone or a team, or but okay. we need someone to produce something that is measurable. And as I told you, we did that mistake this year, having something that is not that easy to measure. And so, yes, this is what we've changed for, for the upcoming year. Yeah. So you always read like everything and it's uh, opposite about uh, how to measure. I've read somewhere that uh, you have to choose leading indi indi indicators since that, uh, instead of trailing indi indi indicators. So if it trails, uh, you will know too late that you are not meeting the key results. Uh, if it's uh, leading, uh, you will know exactly, so for example, number of hours spent, you know that in advance, or you, uh, you know it right away. Trading is like a metric on the product, you know it after it's shipped, so it might be too late to know you're not reaching that. What, what's your take ah, on that? Okay. Uh, you're right. Uh, so it depends, I think it depends on the, if I understood correctly the question, uh, we have, uh, once again, uh, I think a solid product process, meaning that uh, very early in the process, when we want just to be able to see if an initiative is a good one or not, uh, the product team is doing what we call discovery. So basically, they go on the field, they try to collect data, they try to uh, list hypotheses, facts, etc. Uh, they have on, on a given initiative. Okay, And why we do that? Because we want to lower the risk we will take to develop this feature. Okay, so either we already have uh, analytics metrics or product metrics because you basically want to make uh, a new version of an existing feature. So most of the time you will already have the metrics to be able to say, okay, I'm starting here and we want to go there. This is the easy part. When you are building a completely new feature, uh, it's a bit more difficult because you don't always have data to be able at least to think about the starting point. We are at, I don't have a general recommendation on that, but at Mayor's Island, we have two main uh, cases on that. One is on the B2B side for the real estate agencies. And 
most of the time, the metrics that we will use is basically a take rate on the product, on uh, how many real estate agencies will use our product, or if we want to work on retention on the product, we know already that we have uh, an average usage uh, per agent of, uh, let's say, uh, two usage per week. So we have metrics and we can use that. When we don't, uh, the product guys, they are trying to define like uh, they, they basically pick uh, four, five, uh, six uh, uh, agents uh, which we already work with and they are doing some kinds of uh, user testing, uh, sometimes with paper, basically we draw something, we make them use, etc. We want to test if they, they want to use it or not. Okay? So it depends really on the, on the context. Uh, whether you are making a new version of an existing feature or a completely new one. When you are on a website with a lot of users, we are lucky enough to have like around uh, 2 million of users, unique users per month on the website, you are able to run a lot of tests and you can do really small tests. So sometimes when you don't have uh, good enough metrics to be able to decide, we basically do some kinds of A-B testing. and We test it on a portion of the traffic usually 10 to 20% of the traffic. Uh, when I'm talking about uh, doing some tests, we actually develop a part of a feature, but we also develop the analytics coming with it to be able to collect metrics. We collect it for a week or two weeks or a month sometimes if we don't have uh, that much traffic on, on this specific part of the website. And when we have that, then we decide what result we should expect uh, on this feature. Okay, and so uh, once again, you have the master objectives and key results, and then you, uh, the job of the product manager is to take it and sometimes to split it in more concrete metrics, most of the time analytics metrics, to be able to decide whether we should go in the right direction or, or not. So yes, this is uh, uh, what we are doing, and depending on the context, uh, it's easy or not. Thank you. Still on the OKRs, um, so you, you have a company OKRs, which are defined, I guess, by the um, ex, uh, exec committee. Yes, one time, one time per year by the executive committee. Okay, and then I guess you cascade it, like uh, like uh, through business units and maybe then maybe sub teams. Mm -hmm. But do you have uh, like a bottom up uh, building of these OKRs, or it's only top down? Uh, it's. The, we start by a more top-down approach. Uh, I mean, at least for the main objectives definition and main key results uh, definition, the three OKRs. Uh, this is uh, basically the management committee uh, which defined it. Then we have a big phase. We'll do that uh, early January, uh, where everyone in the company uh, can basically uh, suggest initiatives for each of the OKRs. So we collect everything but uh, we ask people when you, uh, you suggest a new initiative, you need to provide us with at least hypotheses, facts, if you can, data, uh, to explain us why, why you think that uh, this initiative is a good idea. So we have top down uh, at the beginning, bottom up for the initiative uh, contribution. And once we are uh, able to score all the initiatives and to decide, then the product management team present a plan uh, to the management committee to say, okay, the best initiatives are this one, this one, this one. But we also need to decide uh, on a more strategic standpoint if we want to start by the first one or the second one or the third one, etc. So it's a mix of top down and bottom up. And we did that because, as I said, uh, the first year we were more like some kinds of uh, Anarchy, we had a more anarchic process, you know, where everything was bottom up, but it was a bit difficult to have it aligned with the, the company strategy. So, yes, this is what we are doing uh, right now uh, top down for OKR definition, the main ones, and then uh, bottom up for, for the initiatives. So, what is your favorite book about OKRs? What is my favorite book about OKRs? Uh, it's not a book I read, uh, sorry, I'm bad, I think it was an info queue. Uh, some kinds of uh, big article on OKR implementation at Google, where uh, you can find uh, almost everything uh, from the OKR definition to uh, the strategies they use to uh, 
incentive people on OKRs, etc. And it was quite interesting for me. I'm not sure that I actually read a real book about OKR. It was more, yes, I, I read a lot of Medium articles, etc. And the one that made me think about using OKRs was, was one about Google uh, and what they were doing with it. Okay. I'm asking this because there is a book which is called Measure What Matters hmm. uh, by John Doerr, which is uh, like exactly the uh, okay. Google method. Uh, I heard about it, but didn't read it. Well, I have a question on hiring now. Um, I guess I, I was going to ask you what's your hiring process, but I guess the most specific thing uh, I'd like to know is like, w what's a bad developer for you? <laughs> I don't know. Like, uh, or more like, like what, what are the things that will make you like pick one okay. or, or the other? I, I mean, do you put a lot of emphasis on like tests or like more like fit or a mix of? Yeah, a mix of both, I guess. Yes. Um, I mean, in my opinion, but it's true for developers, and I think it's true for every other job in the company. One people can be a bad fit for your company, and maybe uh, he will go work for another company, it will be a big success. So I think it's really, it really depends on your context, and it really depends also on uh, the maturity stage of your team and what you actually need in terms of skills in your team. I'm not really answering your question. Uh, to me, when you are here, uh, junior developers, let's say from zero to two years of, uh, of experience. The human skills, the capacity to learn, the capacity to say, I don't understand what you are asking me to do. I, I'm eager to learn new tech, etc. is really, really important. I think more than the skills, because actually when you are your junior person, maybe uh, he or she has a great potential, but you are more uh, doing a bet on skills and the interpersonal skills, human skills, etc. It's very important. And the human skills, it's important, I think, at every uh, level of experience, everywhere in your team, because the more you grow, the more you increase the number of interactions between people and the more you need people that are able to have good social skills. Because in the end, in my opinion, uh, if you are not Facebook or Twitter, or, you know, these big giant tech companies with really complicated stuff to do in terms of development, tech, etc. For most of us, you obviously need to develop very good software in terms of quality, etc. But the main reason for a tech team or a product team to fail is uh, obviously uh, interpersonal problems between uh, people in your team. So you need to be 100% sure that the guys that you are hiring, hiring in terms of values, in terms of capacity to interact with the rest of the team, you need to be very, very, very strong on that or you will have problems. So in terms of hiring process, uh, we have something I think a bit different from I think what I've seen in other companies. For uh, around two years, I was doing the first interview for every developer. Not the people in my team, not the HR, just to be able to do a quick check on something like what is your project, uh, sharing a bit of a strategy about the company, etc. Just to have a chit chat with the, with the person and to, to have a first hint about whether uh, he or she could be a good match for the team. And we are still doing that. I'm not doing all the interviews right now. It's more the engineering manager, but we kept the fact that we wanted first to check more uh, social skills than technical skills. Then we have a technical interview, which is basically a test. We send the test to the, the candidates, they do that at home, and then they come back at Meyer's agent uh, to basically debrief on the test. It's like a code review by peers, and this is when we have other developers uh, from uh, Mayor's Agent teams that are doing the reviews with, uh, with the candidates. And it's very interesting because you can see, obviously, technical skills, but you also see the fit between the people in the room. And sometimes the quality of the test in terms of 
pure technical skills, it could be interesting, but you cannot see the person uh, interacting well with, uh, with the, the rest of the team, and it's for, for you it's not a good match. So, yes, uh, if I had to pick one, uh, the most important skills, I would say uh, interpersonal and human skills, uh, but obviously you cannot uh, hire developers that are not able to develop, so you also need to check that. But, um, do you have those, at some companies there are some like really trivial tests that are quite academics. Some are less trivial, some more tedious, but still like uh, some people ask you to like write, uh, I don't know, self-balancing tree or something like that. Do, do you have those or? No, we don't. Uh, we, we have uh, the, most of the part of the hiring process are common between the web development team and the data team. The only difference is that for the data team, we also check that they are still able, still able to do some uh, tricky algorithm. And we do that. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, I don't know the word in English, but uh, for the guys in the room uh, that went to uh, pre class preparatoire, uh, l'école, tableau, un feutre, uh, sorry for the French part, uh, we do that. So basically, we do a test on algorithm, but it's more an interaction be between a senior uh, developer in the team and the candidates to see how the, the, the person think about a complex problem. So we do that only on the, on the data side. We were doing that for the web development team as well, but we had a lot of drop at that part uh, with people saying that, okay, it's a bit boring, uh, I don't want to do that, etc. So since we had a lot of drop at this phase, we dropped it. And we, but for all the teams, whether you are on the data team or the web team, we have uh, the technical test. It's not like uh, develop something uh, like you know, all the tests that you can find online. Uh, we have a business case that is very similar to what we do at Meyers Agent. So basically, the guys need to uh, collect some data, listing data, they need to store it in a database, and then they need to build uh, API endpoints to be able to display this data on a map. Okay, so this is for the back-end developers and for the front-end developers. We provide them with an existing API and we ask them to build a given feature or specific features for the real estate uh, agents. And they can choose whatever framework they want. So they can do that in, in React or in Vue.js or whatever. The only thing that is interesting for us is for, for them to explain us why they architecture uh, their code this way, uh, which pattern they use uh, in terms of uh, front-end code, etc. Uh, did they add the time to to develop some kinds of unit testing uh, strategy for, for their test, etc. So it's intensive in terms of investment for them because they will, uh, most of the time, they will spend from four hours to eight or 10 hours sometimes uh, on the test. But this is very concrete. And I think uh, from a candidate standpoint, it's more interesting to work on something real and close to what you will do on a daily basis in the company than then uh, instead of some, uh, sorry, on uh, some more random uh, algorithm stuff that you can find online. Uh, so this is what we decided to do. It works. Sometimes we, are, we have candidates that drop uh, at that specific moment in the hiring process saying that it will take too much time for them to do that. And it's perfectly okay. But it's also a way for us to check in if they are really motivated about the job or not. So. Yes, we lose people at that time, but I think uh, in terms of investment and in terms of confidence for you uh, in the hiring process, it's a, it's a good part of the, of the process. So, yes. And did you change the test often, or is it pretty much the same so that you can compare? Uh, it is exactly the same, uh, I shouldn't say that uh, publicly, <laughs> but it is exactly the same test uh, since I think Four years, okay. and uh, it is uh, yes, it is interesting for you as uh, an hiring manager or even for, for for the team to be able to compare between tests. But after four years, we should change the test because it's uh, a bit boring for us uh, right now <laughs> because we've seen a, a hundred ver different versions of, of the same test. So yes, at some point we, we should make it evolve. But yes, we are using the same for uh, four years. And so are you still now, after four years, sometimes surprised of innovative implementation, or is it pretty much uh, the same now? No, I must admit, not that much. Okay. Um, 
We have, uh, we, on the backend side, we are, doing, we are using Python uh, as a main language. You, we had, the language evolved uh, a lot uh, in, the, in the last uh, years. And we have people that are very uh, aware of the new features of the language. So sometimes we have people using, you know, very specific evolution of the language. But beside that, in terms of architecture, etc., since the use case is uh, the same, uh, we have most of the time the same implementation. What is interesting also is that we ask them to implement something that works, but uh, during the test, we have 30 minutes dedicated to discuss about architecture and scaling. And based on what they developed, we ask them questions about the scalability of what they did and also if they have uh, ideas about the way they could make it scale. Okay? And at this specific moment, in terms of architecture, you can have people that are very focused on applicative architecture, like, okay, in Python, I will do this or that, etc. You have, you have people that knows very well AWS or Google Cloud Platform and tells you that I should use this kind of managed service to do that, etc. So in this specific part, we have creative people and we learn uh, sometimes features uh, on a given cloud platform, for example, that we didn't know about. On the pure implementation of the test, honestly, some, it's not always the same, but it's pretty similar. At least for the guys that succeed in the test, the, the solutions are pretty similar. Hi. Uh, and so, do you have a DevOps team? And uh, at what point did they join, if you have one? We do. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, uh, when I joined the company, we had like the super strong skilled CTO of the company and he was doing like three jobs in one job. And basically he was the guy that was doing most of the ops job. But uh, we were also uh, hosted, not on a cloud platform, we were hosted in a small uh, French data center. So uh, a year after I joined, we decided to switch to uh, Cloud Platform, so to Google Cloud Platform, uh, in fact. And when we did that, uh, we did that with uh, an external company to help us uh, learn about Google Cloud Platform, uh, the good patterns, etc., and to uh, help us during the migration. And once we did that, we started to hire uh, DevOps. So now we have uh, a team of three people, uh, two guys that are doing some... Uh, uh, I don't know the exact word, let's say site reliability engineering. Uh, so two people for this. And one guy that is more focused on productivity engineering, you know, he's the guy responsible to develop uh, scripts, to uh, improve the tooling, uh, the continuous integration process to make it faster, etc. So he's very focused on the productivity of the teams. And this is a new role in the team. We, we had the guy, a senior uh, developer, that is uh, doing that for now two months, two to three months. And uh, for the next year, we are planning to, uh, to hire two more uh, people in the DevOps team. Because actually we, grow, we grew like a lot, uh, the development and data team, and we didn't hire any guy in the team uh, during the year. And they have like a big backlog. It's too difficult to, to handle it. So yes, we are hiring new people. But when you are uh, at uh, early in your uh, development, uh, sorry, in uh, your, your company grow, uh, I think that you can uh, have people in your team, senior developers, etc., that are actually doing the DevOps job. Once you reach a certain size, which is our case, you need to define uh, SLAs, uh, you need to commit to a big uh, real estate uh, agents about uh, the disponibility of your service, etc. So the availability, sorry, of the service. So at some point, uh, having dedicated people to that, uh, it's, a, it's a good option. But we did that uh, three, three years ago and the company was already eight years old. So depends on your context, I think. Um, I have a question uh, about uh, before joining uh, Mayorajan. Uh, is, um, 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 were you scared about the fact that there are only 10% of the company that are tech 
And, and what was your question about that? Uh, before I joined, I was in a more early stage uh, startup. Uh, so basically, I had to build a team. We were uh, three uh, to start. And when I left, we were around 15, uh, 15 to 20 people in the tech team. So I already had the situation where you have to build a team. But so I wasn't afraid before joining. Also because uh, I was hired by a friend, a good friend. So he sold me the company like uh, it was perfect. It was incredible, etc. And it was true. It was really a good company. But I was more afraid after one or two months. Okay, because when you see all the things that everyone in the company wants to develop, etc., and you see that you have 10 people, okay, uh, and, and your main mission is to make it scale, <laughs> okay, I was a bit afraid at that, at that moment. But uh, in terms of company culture, what was interesting was that uh, the founders, investors, etc., they were quite ambitious about what they wanted to achieve but they were also uh, very supportive with me on the delay and the time that was uh, necessary to build a good team. And what I did when I joined was to be sure that we were aligned on what we wanted to build uh, as a tech and product team, okay? Uh, I'm not a fan of making an average, a big average team, you know, with hundreds of developers, etc. I'm not a fan of it and I don't think that I'm the best person to run these kinds of teams because when you have 200 or 300 or 400 of developers, it is another scale. And since I was more a CTO of a rather uh, small uh, startup, I wasn't the best person to do that. But since we were aligned on the fact that we wanted to spend time uh, on the hiring process to be sure that we have uh, relatively small teams but of very skilled people, we were aligned on that, so I had the, uh, the mandate to, to be able to, to make it scale. And so, yes, but I was, I was afraid, yes, to, uh, two or three months after joining, it was uh, like, okay, we have a lot to do and we are not that much, so <laughs> it was quite complicated. But So uh, uh, still about hiring, um, do you have a rough number of how many people you interview for one uh, year? For this year, um, well, it's, it's, this year it's huge. Uh, the product team, there were like four people, I think, uh, at the beginning of the year. Well, maybe five people, and there are now 10 people, so we doubled the size of the team. Uh, on the web development side, it's not that much, but um, there are like 20 people. It's more uh, seven to eight uh, new people in the, in the development team on the web side, and on the data side, um, data, data science, etc., the, the size doubled. So we were like 10 people yeah, and we are not 20. My question was more about the ratio on how many people you interviewed. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> how many people? Uh, it's better now, yeah. uh, as I told you about uh, having uh, someone in the HR team that do a lot of screening of candidates, etc. So the, the guys that we are now interviewing in terms of uh, uh, average level, they are way better than we, what we had before. But still, uh, I would say from one people we have at the beginning of the process, or from, sorry, from 10 people at the beginning, maybe one at the end, okay. maybe, maybe less. So it's, as I said, it's very intensive in terms of time. Uh, and uh, I'm not saying that we are the guys that decide to drop all the people during the process. Obviously, you can have people uh, finding uh, another job that is more interesting for them, etc. We are all the case of, uh, of drop at every phase of the of the process, okay. but I would say yes, ten to ten to one, something like that. Yeah, um, maybe to finish, like how long uh, would the process last? Like how how much do you make your candidates wait? As <laughs> short as possible in terms of process size. So uh, it depends on the candidate. It's it's not that easy. It also depends on the candidate because sometimes they have other process in parallel, etc. But uh, we try to be as fast as possible. This is the number one mission for the managers. 
We also try to have uh, the team that is able to do some technical tests, etc. Uh, a candidate that is available, in a week, he can start the first interview and have a proposal from us. It is the best case scenario. Depending on the context, etc., it can take more like two weeks, etc. But more than two weeks uh, in this market right now, uh, yeah. with companies uh, everywhere trying to get the same guys, you take risk. So I would say from one to two weeks. Uh, and depending on the context, sometimes it takes more time, but uh, yes. Are we done? Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs>